Hey, welcome back, everyone. We have a special live Q&A tonight, so thanks for tuning in. This is going to be our special China webinar, uh, hopefully the first of many to come. We have some great guests lined up. Tonight, we're going to be having a great discussion, as I said, about China and Chinese cyber attacks. We'll be talking with Casey Fleming, CEO of Black Ops Partners, Gordon Cheng, columnist and author of The Coming Collapse of China, one of the top experts on the CCP, Nan Su, a senior reporter at the Epic Times, and Gregory Copley, president of International Strategic Studies Association. So folks, get ready for it. We're gonna be going into this in just a bit. We're gonna be talking about not just cyber. I think people are bored of cyber. I think cyber has become something kind of detached from us. We wanna to try to go into what is really behind the cyber attacks we're watching from the Chinese Communist Party. What does this really mean? Why should we really care about it? And what's the broader picture, the bigger goal behind all of this? Now, before we get started, tonight's episode is brought to you by Secure, and so big thanks out to our sponsor. There are over 155 million Americans affected by data leaks in 2020 alone. The average American had their personal data stolen about four times over the year. People get anxious because they can't protect their online data and activity, but now there's a new email and messenger app called Secure, that's S-E-K-U-R. They can give privacy and security for sending emails and messages. Secure's server and data center are hosted in Switzerland, and that's important because Switzerland has the strictest data privacy laws in the world. Secure is also the only private and secure messaging and email app that doesn't rely on big tech companies like Amazon, Google, or Microsoft, which means they're not, in, they're not subject to the intrusive cloud app. Also, Secure does not ask for your phone number, does not mine your data, and also does not upload your contacts like all, the, all other applications do. The secure messenger functions by adding people you know and adding their secure number. You can also still chat with non-secure users with a simple invite. In this way, you're protected from hackers getting onto your phone and you have full privacy on the app itself. It costs only $5 for the messenger and $10 for the email and messenger package. You can visit secure.com today. You can get a seven day free trial and also use the promo code Joshua to get 25% off. So big thanks, uh, big thanks out to secure for sponsoring this special episode. All right, folks, that's let's bring in our guests and let's start this discussion. We are gonna go into questions around the halfway mark as well. So if any of you have questions, leave them in the chat. And thanks for being here, folks, let's jump into it. So first off, we're gonna be bringing in, uh, we have Gordon Cheng, you may know him. He's a columnist and author of The Coming Collapse of China. Uh, really pleasure, a pleasure to have him here, Gordon, thank you. Well, thank you so much, Josh, I really appreciate it. We also have Casey Fleming. He's CEO of Black Ops Partners. Hey, Casey, good seeing you. Thanks for having me. We have Gregory Copley, President of International Strategic Studies Association. And Gregory, wonderful having you here with us. Great to be with you. And we have Nan Su, a senior reporter at the Epic Times. And Nan, always a pleasure having you on. Oh, Josh, thank you for having me. All right, folks, that said, let's go into the first uh, topics for the night. And again, if you have questions for any of our guests, please leave them in the chat. If you want to have a broad question, I can uh, put it to the best guest we'd have for that particular question. But if you want to direct a question at a particular guest, just write it in the question also. All right, that said, let's start with the first topic. I want to go into the Biden administration recently making an announcement that cyber could lead to a hot war meaning that, yes, we're dealing with the cyber, cyber war right now, as they're calling it, but cyber may not just be isolated to computers and you know, online accounts. This could be something that could spill over into real war. And so I want to start with this topic. Um, actually, maybe we could start with um, uh, Gordon Cheng. If you can tell us, uh, what's your take on, I guess, the Chinese Communist Party's cyber war, and what are they doing in, do, you, do you think they're doing anything that could constitute real war, that would justify real war? Well, Josh, uh, they're hoovering up all the world's data. They want to put it into their artificial intelligence systems, and God knows what they're going to do with it then. But also, it's, it's not just a question of data collection. Uh, I mean, they've been very thorough about that. As we heard from Matt Pottinger, who was Deputy National Security Advisor, They've, they've probably accumulated enough to create a dossier, a dossier on every American. Also at that Senate uh, hearing at the, on the 4th of this month, we've heard that uh, every American adult or 80% of American adults have had all their personal data taken. 
and the other 20 percent, uh, we were told, had 80 percent of their data taken. So this has really been the most thorough attempt ever. Um, but it's not just a question of data collection. It's also, I think, a question of manipulating uh, s networks to do what uh, Beijing wants. Remember, we're talking 5G with the Internet of Things. Everything will be connected to um, the Internet, which means that they can turn off uh, your pacemaker if they want to. And clearly they could do things which would constitute acts of war, especially messing with our critical, critical infrastructure. So, yes, this is a problem which is not just a question of what they want. It's a question of what they can do. Hmm. Uh, Casey Fleming, what, what's your take on this? It's cyber war, cyber attacks. How close is this to real war in your assessment? It's danger close. Uh, I've been in cyber quite a very long time. Uh, and cyber is really the backbone to everything now, the way that we built our, our industry, our world, the way we, we have information flow, the way we do research and development and so on. So cyber is the backbone and it's, it's at the line. If you want to know where, where my opinion is, um, it's, it's at the line and, and even crosses over the line where we're not actually being offensive and going back after the, uh, the perpetrators which is we're talking about the CCP here, but it's also the Russia, Iran and North Korea. So, um, you know, Gordon mentioned that if if they get close to disrupting our supply chain, talk about food, water, electricity, those are acts of war, uh, hospitals, uh, you know, where they're, you know, uh, harming Americans or harming anybody in the West. There is a bigger picture here. We'll talk about that a little bit later. But um, Cyber is, uh, is a key facilitator to many other methods that they're using in, in their overarching strategy. And again, we'll discuss that later. Back to you, Josh. Hmm. Uh, Greg Compton, I'm curious on your take on this. When it comes to the Chinese cyber attacks, I mean, people think economic theft. I, economy, businesses, a lot of people draw a hard line between that and real war. What's your assessment? Well, the reality is that cyber war is war, and the United States unwittingly is already at war with the People's Republic of China. Uh, but all countries, the United States included, every country in the world, uh, down to some of the smallest African countries, are engaged in some form or other of cyber warfare. Uh, the interesting thing is when it gets to m move from the theft of data or the manip manipulation of data or the use of someone's data to uh, change uh, electoral positions or to promote certain theories and moves up into the strategic spectrum, more into the sp strategic spectrum, uh, then it becomes a, a, a critical element. Cyber warfare is the new strategic weapon of the 21st century, uh, and it is far more effective than nuclear weapons. So if people are becoming bored with um, cyber warfare, then they don't understand it because this is the weapon which can totally immobilize almost any society. And the more electrically dependent a society is, the more vulnerable it is to cyber attack. And if you were to close down, for example, the electrical grid between Northern Virginia and up to Nova Scotia on the uh, Northeastern American continent, what you would get if you could maintain this closure of the, of the network for a couple of weeks are millions and millions of people dead and the commerce of the United States, the productive capability, completely destroyed. This would uh, not be the equivalent of an electronic Pearl Harbor. It would be uh, an order of uh, 10 orders of magnitude more significant than Pearl Harbor because it would be most difficult uh, to, for the US to recover from that. So the US itself obviously is considering offensive operations and has already uh, has those capabilities in place. Uh, and it is this race which is uh, if you like, the new arms race of the 21st century. The reality is that we're in a new era of warfare these days, which is uh, not one which is restricted to military confrontations. If the People's Republic of China gets into a military confrontation with the United States, then it has already lost the war because that, it, a conventional military war is not the kind of war which the PRC has the strategic depth to survive, mm. uh, but they can reach into the heartland of the United States and take out its infrastructure. And, and even at an operational military level, they can uh, inhibit or blunt 
the the new weapons uh, which are, are being deployed by the U.S. and and vice versa. Uh, mm. U.S. Weapons, Very interesting weapons. Yeah, uh, Nan Su, I know you have a lot of insight into how the kind of the let's say the inner workings of the Chinese Communist Party from a lot of your reporting. You have, of course, a lot of insights into how the CCP works and how the leaders of it think. In your assessment, how does the Chinese Communist Party regard this, and, and what is kind of the underlying story, would you say, behind cyber warfare? Well, cyber warfare belongs to what Chinese military call as a unconventional and unrestricted warfare. The Chinese military started uh, researching on this subject and how to do this kind of a war against the Western world uh, in the late 90s. Uh, so they already have a book published uh, in the 90s, so think about this, uh, they have been launched you know, this kind of a warfare against the Western world ever since the 90s. And, you know, most of the people living in the Western world didn't even feel it, didn't even know about it. So um, uh, besides the power group, they can also launch their attack directly to our like a, a, a missile system or space program, um, our nuclear weapon system. You know that that really going to uh, um, impact the capacity of uh, U.S. military, and also uh, one thing we really um, I really want to mention is uh, so far based on uh, what we know of uh, the cyber attack from China are basically organized by two groups. One is the Chinese military. Another one is the Chinese Ministry of State Security. Uh, now. Here's very important. For both of these group, the top of the first line of their motto statement for both of these groups are the loyalty to the party, meaning loyalty to CCP. So basically, this kind of attack from China, they are not randomly happened. They are the attack from directly from Chinese Communist Party. Uh, doing it in the way of unrestricted warfare. They have been doing the research, uh, you know, set it up uh, how to do it ever since the, uh, ever since the 90s. Hmm. Now, one of the big announcements from Xi Jinping, head of the Chinese Communist Party recently, was a new propaganda campaign they want to launch. This is, of course, in light of the uh, coronavirus pandemic, traced back to, the, traced back to Wuhan, China. And the CCP really kind of going into overdrive, preventing research, looking at the origins of the virus, targeting anybody who talks about the origins of the virus and trying to frame the US as the enemy in all of this. Uh, the Chinese Communist Party tried launching a wolf warrior. They call it a diplomacy strategy, which is a hard line form of diplomacy that really backfired in a lot of countries. Many countries, Australia, many parts of Europe, uh, India have taken much stronger stances against the CCP because of this. And so in light of all this, Xi Jinping announced a new propaganda campaign, one to uh, kind of say clear the field, so to speak, ideologically for the CCP. Now, when it comes to the idea of ideological warfare, the, the CCP has the, what they call the three warfares doctrine, which is psychological warfare, media warfare, and legal warfare adopted into its military code. Uh, but I know one of the big questions people might have is how does ideology fit into cyber war? Uh, to what extent does ideology play into this? And we see some examples of it. We see them targeting information like OPM, Office of Personnel Management, going after security clearance data on U.S. officials. We see them targeting data that cannot be monetized. And so is there, I guess, an overlap with, let's say, ideology in cyber? And if not, how does this whole issue of, of ideology fit into the broader objectives of the CCP? Uh, for that to start with Gordon Cheng again, and uh, Gordon, I'm curious what your take is is on this. Uh, Gordon, I think Josh, you're I lost him here. Oh, there you go. I, I hear you now, yeah. Gordon. You good? And so I'm good. I lost the right, connection, so I didn't hear most of the question. But Josh, no, no there's worries. one thing that yeah. I would like to say just on that on that last question, and that is the question of the Chinese being villains. But as Nansu said, they've been doing this since the end of the 90s, and the United States has failed to respond. And that's also true of a lot of other countries. We know what the Chinese are doing. We know they're engaged in massive theft. We know they're manipulating our networks, and yet we don't impose costs on China. And this was, I think, dramatically um, brought to our attention 
when the Biden administration a few weeks ago um, said that uh, the Chinese Ministry of State Security was involved in soft exchange hack and was working hand in hand with criminal ransomware attackers. And yet the Biden administration didn't impose any costs on China. And we heard Ann Neuberger, who is the deputy national security advisor for cyber and emerging technology. We Americans didn't impose any costs because we couldn't get our allies to agree with us, which is basically saying, well, they have a veto over the enforcement of American law, that China just committed a criminal act and we're not going to do anything about it. So this is a confeebleness uh, more than anything else. I know, Casey, you've been kind of working in the area between military and government and uh, private businesses and trying to get them all to speak the same language, so to speak. What do, what do you think the disconnect is between it? Well, I guess, first off, do you, do you agree with Gordon's uh, assessment that pretty much more needs to be done to, proactively to target the CCP with things like this, that we've allowed them to, to, to do this essentially? And if so, where do you think the disconnect is in terms of moving things forward? Uh, first, Gordon was absolutely spot on. He knows his stuff. Um, uh, the, the, you got to really look at the whole big picture. I, I'd like to step back. The audience really needs to understand that there's only one China, and it is completely controlled by the Chinese Communist Party. Their values are diametrically opposed with our values. The Chinese Communist Party will never coexist with any other nation state. Uh, the book that uh, Greg was talking about was called Unrestricted Warfare, was released in uh, 1999 by two Chinese colonels from the People's Republic of China. That army, by the way, is not for the people. That army is only in business and sworn to protect and keep the Chinese Communist Party in power. There are some basic fundamentals that the audience needs to be aware of that um, when we think of China, we, we think of them like another country, and they're not because it's, it's run by a regime that is completely focused on taking out democracy, freedom, and uh, the entire free world and ruling it with uh, uh, communism, Chinese communism, which is uh, a derivative of Leninist uh, communism. So, you know, uh, Greg made, made a comment. He used the word war, and Greg is absolutely correct. Um, when, you're, when your adversary says that they call you the enemy and they say that they're at war with you, then by golly, you're at war. This all started, uh, nation, this all started formally in a nation state program in 1986, month number three, mm -hmm. which was the CC pro, P, CCP program called Program 863. And I'll give you my paraphrase. We're going to lie, cheat, and steal and completely replace the United States and dominate and control the world. And that was 1986, month number three, month number three program 863. So what does unrestricted mean? Unrestricted means no rules. The United States and the West, all they characterize us by uh, uh, we're a nation of laws. Those are rules. The Chinese Communist Party says those are your rules. They're not ours. We don't have any rules. We have rules for our country, our people. And if you're going to do business in our country, you're going to do things our way. And that's what our that's what our American companies are being forced to do with our data, our information, which is our own personal information, as well as our corporate IP, intellectual property, research development and so on. So those are some basic framework uh, uh, elements that I think the audience needs to be aware of, of really who we're dealing with here. Uh, for those of us on this panel, you've got an esteemed panel here. I've been doing this more than a decade, and I'm, I can probably tell you the rest of these guys have been doing it longer than I have. So um, it's very serious, and it is war, and it's a war that we're not familiar with. And the United States and the, our Western allies all believe war to us means conventional warfare. That means uniforms, troops, uh, guns, planes, ships, and all that. That is not the kind of war that uh, that our enemy is focused on. Yes, I use the word enemy and a war. Basically, the war that they are engaged in against every man, woman and child in America and all of our allies is unrestricted war. And that's everything short of conventional warfare. What that means is they want to weaken our economy. They want to weaken everything to do with us. Drug warfare, education warfare, telecommunications warfare, cyber warfare, religious warfare. There's literally over 100 different methods of unrestricted hybrid warfare that I think that the audience needs to be aware of. So sorry to, uh, to give a little bit more of a definition of what we're really talking about, but I thought it might be helpful at this point in, uh, in this show. Back to you, Josh. Mm. Yeah, great insights. Thank you, Casey. 
I want to ask Nan. I want to ask Greg and Nan a couple more questions on this. But uh, real quick, Gordon, I'm, I'm curious what your assessment is on this. Do you agree with Casey's assessment? And you mentioned that not enough's being done. Essentially, we've let them do it. What what can be done in your assessment? Pose the most severe costs on China's economy. I mean, there. When they have a cyber attack, it doesn't mean we have to reply in the same way with cyber. And I think that we probably want to disguise and hide our capabilities until we actually need them. Whereas I deny our market to China, I would deny investment dollars to China, I would、uh, terminate all research partnerships with Chinese entities. You know, China last year their merchandise trade surplus with the U.S. It was 58.0 option dice surplus. That gives us enormous leverage over China, and we're not doing this. So there's a number of ways that we can impose those costs. And and Josh, of course, the costs that we impose have to be greater than the benefits that China obtains. And we know that China's 500 billion dollars worth of U.S. intellectual property each year. That is the assessment of John Radcliffe when he was director of national intelligence. So that means that our costs on China have to be at least five hundred billion dollars a year, and probably more, to have an effect doing what they're doing. Hmm. Yeah. Thank. Great insights. Thank you,、uh, Greg Copley. I know you, of course, do a lot of research on military.、Um, interviewed interviewed you to some of your offices before. You have, of course, ex- extensive knowledge and huge collections of books on this stuff, and I, I think have good insight tying traditional military into modern. Uh, forms of military issues. When when it comes to how we should respond to what the CCP is doing, I, I think、uh, Gordon makes a good point that you need you can't just respond in like essentially, and you need to make sure that not only are you mitigating or negating what they're gaining from it, but even doing something to punish them to some degree to make sure they don't keep doing it. What do you think can be done? Well, first you have to understand what kind of war you're in.、Uh, you cannot win a war. If you don't know a war is being waged against you, and it's very difficult to win a war,、uh, even if you know something's happening, but you don't understand the context and rules of that war. Now, it doesn't mean to say that you have to fight the same kind of war as your adversary,、uh, but in the case of the People's Republic of China, they understand that their best form of warfare is this new total war, this amorphous war in, in which they engage. All segments of society against all segments of Western society, particularly U.S. society. So you can't even draw boundaries between, even shall we say, legal warfare and medical warfare, because everything merges into an opportunistic, amorphous move forward against your adversary. And、uh, of course, as they said in 1986,、uh, lie, cheat, and do whatever you need to do to win. But we have to also look. At what this new、uh, form of warfare entails, and it's been evolving, particularly since the early 21st,、uh, 20th century,、uh, with、uh, the electronic movement of propaganda and signals and signals intelligence. So we we started to see this whole electronic spectrum of intelligence and and warfare move forward, and the U.S. was the indisputable master of this during the Vietnam War. It, Pioneered the use of what was then called electronic warfare and electronic countermeasures, and these were mainly aimed at signals intelligence. How do you jam、uh, signals of your adversary, their radars, their ability to acquire you as a target, and so on? But it's also about how you carry messages into your adversary, and this was done electronically even through World Wars One, One and Two, but particularly in the Cold War. And what we have to see is that cyber war, information war,、uh, and electronic warfare are companion、uh, capabilities within the psychological strategy framework. Because ultimately, the only goal of warfare, whatever form of warfare you use, is to alter the will of your adversary, to make sure that your will dominates. Now that can be through the killing of people, or it can be through the neutralisation of their systems, or just forcing them in some way to change their mind. And so, what what the、uh, CCP is doing is a combination of all of these things, but very carefully, because in the knowledge that if they go beyond the boundary、uh, of acceptability or visibility, 
then the US might respond kinetically, in other words, with formal military things. But the, the interesting thing is that what, uh, so the whole cyber war spectrum information war, propaganda war the spectrum is doing is trying to find out how to intercept uh, political as well as physical weapons. Uh, in other words, if you're going to get an ICBM into China, you have to be aware that they are doing many things to neutralize that, that ballistic missile and the warhead before it hits its target. And by the way, the US is doing the same thing quite logically. But what we tend to forget is that when we're sending messaging, in other words, we're trying to reach into the minds of our adversaries, uh, we have to be conscious of what messages will reach the target audiences and influence them. Uh, as Casey said, the uh, wolf warrior diplomacy uh, has backfired for Beijing on numerous occasions, Australia, India and the like, when there's this, this attempt to intimidate through bluster uh, and escalated uh, rhetoric, uh, it backfires because it merely creates the opposite effect uh, than the one desired in the target audiences. As I said, with the wolf warrior diplomacy in Australia, uh, uh, the, the rhetoric was so heated and bombastic that it made Xi Jinping look like a, a Queensland cane toad, which, cane toad, which puffs itself up to, to look more fearful, uh, sorry, more, more uh, distressing to an adversary. Uh, but it didn't, in fact, intimidate the audiences in, in those countries. Hmm. Now, Nan, I want to ask you, we talked about unrestricted warfare and kind of the broader picture on this. I, I want to go into a bit on the ideological element behind all this, because as uh, Greg Copley noted, I mean, great analysis on this, as, as you noted, that the ideology and psych the psychological element plays a huge role in this. We see this, for example, in what they're doing with the Confucius Institutes. We see this, for example, in, uh, well, again, their control of Hollywood. Uh, we see this, for example, in the control of media with the uh, great firewall blocking the internet. We see all this playing out, and this is a key part of all of this. But Nancy, I want to ask you, first of all, you know, we talked about unrestricted warfare and these real technical sides of all this and some details on it. For the Chinese Communist Party, what's the purpose of this? What do they hope to achieve with this? Well, the purpose is to keep, uh, to keep their ruling power uh, now, this is one thing we, I, I, I want to go one step uh, back uh, because all of you already talked about uh, the warfare. Uh, but one thing, uh, I think one gap, a lot of people don't even understand it's why, what actually has led us to where we are right now. And I think it, uh, one thing, it's huge, it's that we need to realize we need to change our mentality. Uh, even by today, there's a lot of uh, public uh, policy makers and a lot of people living in the Western world still thinking that our technology and our investment, when we throw those things into China, it will eventually change China and, and push the Chi uh, Chinese Communist Party, CCP, for a political reform. But however, in the past uh, 20 years after China joined WTO, that China the economy, it's really booming. The technology from the Western world really modernized the, the, uh, the, uh, uh, modernized the China. But what happened? And uh, what has happened? And that actually a lot of people don't even realize that, that it's actually a part of the unrestricted warfare. Now, uh, a lot of people uh, in the Western world have the wishful thinking, you know, uh, when we give the technology to China, China will be modernized. And when we uh, help China's economy grow and China will have a larger population of a middle class. So therefore, they will ask the middle class will ask for more democracy, more freedom, and eventually will push China uh, to change. But what happened really in the reality in China is totally different. So first of all, when our technology uh, went to China, China used those technology to build a big firewall, which basically blocked all the um, information that Chinese communist regimes think uh, it's, uh, it's uh, reflecting the universal values of human rights, uh, democracy, and freedom. They blocked. And then they, they, if you leave China, if you actually live in China, you will notice this. Day in and day out, literally every single day of 355 days a year, you're going to hear this. 
the only reason that has led China's economic success in the past 40 years is because the leadership of the Chinese Communist Party. So the entire population in China is indoctrinated in day in and day out. That's how they did it. See, all this, that's what they make these things happen. So they actually use what we hope for, the economic success will lead to the political reform, but they use it to prove that the economic success is because of the leadership of Communist Party. Therefore, and the, the Communist leadership, uh, it's the only choice for Chinese people for its future success. The current political system, the one party control system in China actually work. So that's the, re you know, you see there is a huge difference between what we try to accomplish over there when we throw our technology and money to China and what actually has been accomplished by the regime. So, so now things totally changed um, after 40 years. I believe uh, that was uh, back in the early 80s, the second generation of Communist Party leader Deng Xiaoping. His uh, famous uh, line was uh, in Chinese, four characters, Tao Guang Yang Hui, meaning keep your head down, hide your strengths, and uh, you know, focus on growing your capacity. But now, uh, this year, in, back in March uh, of this year, uh, uh, during the uh, National Congress, uh, or People's Congress Assembly, Xi Jinping basically said, China can finally head up the world. Think about what that means. It's a strategic thing. Uh, uh, it's a strategic thing, uh, change for the Chinese Communist Party to lead to the next stage of their development. They are really thinking now to challenge the dominant power of the United States as well as the universal values uh, of the Western world. They have been doing that, but not as uh, not in the large scale like the last couple of years that you mentioned, uh, uh, the implement, uh, implementation of Hong Kong security law, the, the wolf warrior diplomacy, and a couple months ago that uh, the China passed a, 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 a new piece of legislature called the uh, anti-foreign sanction law, so far and so forth. And all these things, you know, basically it all point to one direction. They are already thinking of the next 30 years. They're not going to rely on the technology and investment from the Western world. They want to dominate the world themselves now. Hmm. Yeah, thank you, man. Great, good insights. So, uh, Greg, you have uh, something to add? Yeah, um, I think it's important uh, to note that just because um, Xi Jinping has declared war and is m making this capability uh, visible, if you like, not biding his time, not keeping his head down, uh, doesn't mean that they have the capability to do it. Uh, they, the reality is that as the situation becomes worse, economically and, and, and socially in the People's Republic of China, the CCP becomes more vocal and more vociferous. Um, and th the reality is that this is disguising, I think, an inherent weakness. And uh, within this framework, of course, the amount of cyber warfare being directed at the Western world and in the United States across the spectrum of activity is almost nothing as compared to the cyber warfare imposed on the Chinese population itself, uh, because if the, the CCP cannot contain the population and stop it from rising up uh, as it's starting to do in many areas, uh, particularly as uh, social conditions worsen, as the economy worsens, as freedom of movement declines, uh, the CCP has to devote much of its cyber warfare activity against its own population. And that's not, not just in uh, controlling the data on their lives, controlling whether they can actually get uh, cash to, to buy a meal or to catch a bus or something. It's basically can, it's, it's life and death really uh, for the Chinese people as a result of this control. Uh, mm -hmm. So uh, <coughs> the CCP is fighting a war on two fronts. It's fighting the West and it's fighting its own population at this stage. Hmm. So with that said, let's jump into some of the questions. And this ties into what I was discussing earlier with the ideology element. A question from Jamie, Jamie Wu has said, I think it's important to address Wu Mao, also called the 50 Cent Army. 
aren't these bots and media manipulation techniques a big part of their cyber warfare? So briefly for our audience, the 50 Cent Army is the Chinese Communist Party's hired army of intranet trolls, essentially. Uh, they're people they pay a little bit of money per post to go on websites like YouTube, comments, uh, Facebook, Twitter, uh, and of course, Chinese social media platforms, and to basically defend the CCP or promote the CCP's agendas. Um, actually, Gordon, I think it's a, a good question for you. Uh, the question is about the 50 Cent Army. Aren't these bots and media manipulation techniques a big part of their cyber war? Uh, what's your assessment on this? How does 50 Cent Army fit into this, if at all? If at all what's your assessment? Total mobilization of society. I mean, people call China authoritarian, but it really isn't anymore. It, it is really semi-totalitarian right now. And the 50 Cent Army is very much a part of that, that uh, they're using people um, mass numbers to accomplish propaganda goals. And, and we shouldn't be surprised because we've seen um, Xi Jinping move China back to a total control society. You've got the Great Firewall, as somebody mentioned. We have now a that'll be put in place that'll give everybody a score based on observed behaviors. Um, there's 626 million surveillance cameras. Uh, you put all of this together and, and shows that China is moving towards something that Mao Zedong would be from his, you know, what, what uh, Xi Jinping has talked about, that he has absolute control over the Communist Party and the Communist Party has absolute control over society. So, yes, they need propaganda is very important. Just one other point. We, we don't really... We sort of dismiss propaganda as unimportant. Um, but no, it's not. If you're an insecure leader of a semi-totalitarian society that has all the problems that Greg is talking about, propaganda is absolutely critical. It's a scene. And so, you know, we've seen many instances of uh, Beijing mobilizing people um, to uh, propagate their narratives. And, and this is everything is, is critical right now. And that's why you have the 50 Cent Army, plus you have a whole bunch of Beijing is trying to control not only the narrative inside China, but the narrative outside of China as well. Hmm. Uh, actually, Greg Copley, I, want, I was wondering if you wanted to add to that um, in terms of the, the propaganda element in warfare. You know, the United States really doesn't get involved in this anymore. We did a bit during the Cold War, this kind of telling the American story was our approach. Uh, they actually recently changed the laws in the United States, making it so the government can actually engage directly in using propaganda. But we don't really think of it as a as a weapon. We don't really think of it anymore as a, as a tool. We hear disinformation and misinformation and Russian trolls and all this stuff, but we don't think about how we could use it. How does propaganda and psychological warfare fit into warfare, especially as it relates to what the CCP is doing? Well, psychological strategy psychological warfare is the primary strategic carrier weapon. It really is what you need to, to do in all phases of warfare. Uh, you don't just move militarily, you move militarily when you have to, but in a context which creates an impact before the forces actually connect. Uh, so as Sun Tzu would say, uh, to, to win a war without fighting is the acme of success. But what, what we see, and the United States is definitely engaged in information warfare, psychological warfare, and propaganda to a large degree, not doing it, I think, as well as it could. Uh, the Voice of America today is, for example, literally a propaganda tool because it comes under the State Department, and they are careful about how, uh, how they shape their messages. Before, uh, VOA was uh, not attached to the uh, State Department, and it was actually much more credible but you've got uh, a number of mechanisms like that, and every country does. And we have to think in terms that in both the military and civil and s strategic spectra, the um, psych psychological warfare and propaganda comes in three basic grades, white propaganda, gray propaganda, and black propaganda for psychological operations. White propaganda is what the government says and is seen to be saying. A grey propaganda is where the, the 50 Cent Army comes in, uh, trolling through and, and 
doing stuff on behalf of the party. You can't say it's the government or the party doing it, but you know that this is part of the overall national endeavor. And black propaganda is perhaps the most effective because you cannot trace its roots and you see information coming out in a tangential way often, which leads your audience to a conclusion which you want them to, to reach, which may not be to their benefit. Uh, so uh, you, if you tell somebody directly, as the uh, Communist Party of China, uh, I want you to do this, well, people are going to say, no, we're not going to do that. This is, this is part of the failure of, of wolf warrior diplomacy. But if you have a domestic advocate uh, within a society, for example, come out and say, well, uh, I think we, we need to be nice to Beijing because uh, our trade depends on it or, or whatever. You, you can get people to do things which achieve the objectives without this coming back to the, to the, the sponsor. So uh, just bear in mind that what we are confronting in all of these political and psychological and propaganda operations is uh, white, gray and black operations. Uh, and they have different methodologies uh, and different rules of engagement. Hmm. Yeah, uh, Gregory Gordon Chang, thank you for uh, your responses on that. Another question here is from Tony C. It says, what's the CCP's capability in backdoor access via electronics which are made in China and used in all segments of US tech structure? Uh, we have seen many examples of this, like smartphones having backdoors built into the firmware. Not, in other words, not even on something you can delete. This is like chip level spying where there's vulnerabilities built into chips. We've heard about concerns with pretty much all Chinese electronics. There was a bizarre case years ago uh, where there was a shipment of tea kettles going into China, these electric tea kettles. And they found, they opened them up because the weight was off in the boxes. They checked them in Russia. And they found that there were Wi-Fi chips installed in each of these tea kettles. And when someone plugged them in, that it would infect the local Wi-Fi networks. Um, Casey, I, I know you have some good insight on this. Uh, you were, of course, founder, I believe, of IBM Cyber. Um, to what degree does the Chinese Communist Party use backdoors within electronics that it's manufacturing in China? 100%. You have to assume, we have to assume that the CCP, every piece of technology coming out of China has been weaponized. If it can be weaponized, it will be weaponized, whether it's a charge cable, whether it's a, an appliance, an air conditioner, uh, you just have to assume that everything is being is weaponized uh, from the CCP. Um, a technology like ZTE was banned by the US government. Zoom had a lot of security issues with their encryption keys and their data going through Chinese servers. Uh, a Chinese national is uh, CEO of Zoom. Um, so you kind of have to just look at all the technology and just assume that it's weaponized. You have to understand it's control, the, the entire country is controlled by the Chinese Communist Party. Nothing goes on inside of China without approval from the Chinese Communist Party. And I'll say it probably for the fourth time. You have to assume that every piece of technology, whether it's a computerized technology or it's a, an appliance or whatever, uh, you have to assume that it's weaponized. So the back doors. Uh, have been there in, in for many, many years in, in a lot of the different technologies. Um, TikTok. I mean, a lot of the kids have TikTok and so on and so forth. So all that's weaponized. I'll make also a comment um, on the Great Firewall that Greg mentioned. The great, the great Firewall, you have to look at it from both sides. The Great Firewall keeps the Chinese people insulated and controlled by the CCP. It also limits the outside world from contacting or or using propaganda warfare on the Chinese people. So, so uh, that, that is by design that that Chinese firewall goes one way and that the outside world cannot go back in and do that and go and, and, uh, and influence through whatever, whatever means. We call it uh, cognitive warfare. Information warfare is part of cognitive warfare. Um, so you have to look at that. The other point I wanted to make on that previous subject was um, there have been studies over 85% of all U.S. social media is fake news or false. And it is being driven by, you mentioned the 50 Cent Army. Those are individuals in that 50 Cent Army, but also the 50 Cent Army has engaged or is engaged with, with network bots. In other words, artificial intelligence to make one person look like 50,000 people. 
So you kind of have to look at really what's going on and what our our teenagers are seeing, what our 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 uh, our husbands, wives, families, companies are all seeing on social media that at different tests at different times has been up to 85% information or cognitive warfare. Back to you, George. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you, Casey. Uh, another question here is from Anthony Coolit. It says, how do we counter China's propaganda circulating among the overseas Chinese in other countries, especially in Southeast Asia? Uh, Nan, I think you'd have good insight into this. Um, you know, one concern I've heard raised by a lot of uh, Chinese Americans here in the U.S. is they've observed that a lot of Chinese youth and even a lot of times people leave China and they come to the U.S., they still tend to use Chinese, uh, you know, of course, from China, social media sites uh, like Weibo and so on. The problem that they've raised is that all the news on there is basically curried in favor of the Chinese Communist Party. And so even though they're outside of China, all of the information they're consuming, all the discussions they're having, everything they say is still censored according uh, to what the Chinese Communist Party once said or not said. And so the question here again is, um, how do we counter China's propaganda circulating among the overseas Chinese in other countries? They say especially Southeast Asia, but I would assume it's pretty much the same issue everywhere. Uh, Nancy, what's your, what's your take on that? Uh, I think the, the, the most of the straightforward answer is to tear down China's firewall. Uh, I, I think that uh, uh, that basically the example it was just given to uh, our audience. It just tell us how effective this uh, indoctrinating, this uh, propaganda brainwash uh, process has been uh, conducted by the Chinese communist regime. And so even after these people, you know, they think about this from the kindergarten level. So every grade they move up, they have to pass the examinations. They, they have to use the standard political answers that's given by the communist regime in order to, for them to graduate from each grade level. So by the time they graduate from the high school, by the time they graduate from the uh, university, they, all those things are really embed, embedded deeply in their minds. So they, they don't feel, uh, you know, uh, they're, they're not open anymore. So uh, I, I think uh, that, that they need to be a certain way uh, building in our public policy uh, to really, because this is uh, totally against the spirit uh, of internet. It's supposed to be freedom of information. If we want to, um, uh, send our technology to China, we suppose, uh, you know, to really help the freedom of the people uh, in China, uh, help the freedom of information. We're not supposed to uh, let our, uh, we're not supposed to just close our eyes and let our, our technology used by the communist regime really uh, indoctrinate the Chinese population over there. You think about there's a huge population there, which is also a part of the calculations. If you think the Chinese regime, it's uh, it's doing a warfare against the Western world, uh, you need to count on. See, I I, I say, you know, if you um, compare Chinese communist regime today in any regime in the history, you compare five us back. Number one, the uh, the economic power, number two, the uh, uh, military power, number three, the total technology that's po possessed by the regime, number four, uh, very importantly, the total population in China, and number five, of course, the history of killing its own people. Uh, and you, you compare this regime with any other regime in the history of mankind, you wouldn't find that any uh, other regime in the history of mankind will even even come close to what uh, the, the kind of danger the Chinese communist regime has imposed to today's world. So tear the tear down the uh, firewall. I think it's the most straightforward way to deal with uh, all this unrestricted warfare, is, uh, especially the information warfare and propaganda warfare. Hmm. Another question here is from Mark. Yeah, and thank you, Nan. That's great, uh, great insights. Uh, question here from Mark Luke. It said, why would the USA turn Afghanistan over to China? Um, actually, of course, one of the big topics right now is Afghanistan and the US pullout from Afghanistan and the fallout from that, but also the Chinese Communist Party's partnering with the Taliban. Um, actually, Gordon, I was wondering if you could want to weigh in on this. Why would the USA turn Afghanistan over to China? I guess on that, do you believe that we've turned uh, Afghanistan over to China? 
And what do you, what's your insight on this? Well, first of all, the reason for doing this would be to concentrate American forces where they're really needed, which is East Asia rather than Central Asia, and for the United States to continue what has been called the forever war. Um, I, I believe that we should have stayed there for a number of reasons, but, you know, there are substantial advantages to leaving. Now, there are no substantial advantages to leaving in the way that the Biden administration and this story is going to get worse. But China, I don't think we've turned it over to China. Um, China thinks that it can control the Taliban. And, and the Taliban, of course, is the strongest element in Afghan society now. But remember, there, there are others. The Taliban has become the enemies of China. And the effect of the Afghan uh, Taliban's victory is inspiring the Pakistani Taliban which is very much opposed to China. Um, and we have seen insurgent groups in Bonn go after Chinese interests in Pakistan. So China is right now, and I think in a very difficult situation. Yes, there are things that it can get um, from its relationship with the Taliban, but there's also a lot that it can lose is the investments it's put into Pakistan and it could inflame, and we could see the entire region go up in flames. In which case, um, China would be very much um, a target. Just one other thing. You know, the the Af deal with China. Um, there's real risk for the Afghan Taliban doing that because the Pakistani Taliban and you started to see other uh, insurgent groups uh, are saying that how can you do that to the Afghan? I mean, what you're doing with these athe atheistic monsters. And the Afghan Taliban could actually lose some support. It could lose support to um, the Pakistani Taliban. It could lose support to some of, you know, ISIS, Al-Qaeda. Who knows? I think a big scrambling in the region right now. And I'm not sure that China is actually going to um, benefit because Beijing now has to do something that it's never done before which is to manage a very difficult security situation outside his borders. Hmm. Yeah, great insights. Uh, Greg Copley, I was wondering if you want to respond to that. Yeah. Um, I mean, in, in, in particular, just a couple points. We, we see the Chinese Communist Party trying to make, you know, of course, strengthen their control over Xinjiang or East Turkestan, where they persecute the Muslim Uyghurs. We see them uh, really creating new leadership in that area uh, within the Chinese Communist Party and really clamping down much harder recently on the Muslim Uyghurs. They're going into uh, Pakistan and they're causing trouble with Balochistan, which is an area of Pakistan that regards itself as its own country. And there's terror groups there turning against the Chinese uh, you know, people trying to transport goods. Same thing happening in, in Tajikistan and also in Iran, the Iranians historically really do not like the Taliban. And the CCP is, of course, a key ally of Iran. Um, what's your insights on this? And of course, any response you have to Gordon's questions as well? Well, uh, absolutely, because I just follow on from Gordon's, who I always agree with, actually. Uh, but the reality is that uh, Beijing needs Afghanistan if it's going to get a land bridge to Iran to get the oil and gas pipeline across and to get a secure energy supply from Iran uh, or the Middle East to uh, mainland China without going through the Indian Ocean and South China Sea to a large extent. So um, what that required was for Beijing to make a deal with the Taliban, just as uh, the Trump administration was attempting to make a deal with the Taliban, but forgetting that the Taliban is essentially Pashtun uh, uh, Sunni uh, population. And the other great component of Afghan society, of course, is the Shia, uh, Tajik and Dari speaking, Persian speaking element of society. So when but either the US or the, or the PRC were trying to do a deal with the Taliban, the reality was that they were never going to get the kind of peace they required over all of Afghanistan, because they could, if they got the Taliban, they wouldn't get the, North, the Northern Alliance groups of Tajik, Dari speakers and the like. What Beijing hopes to do is to say, well, Beijing will placate the Taliban and the Pashtun, and Iran will somehow placate 
or deal with the Dari speaking Shia group so that between them they'll cobble together enough stability to get a pipeline across the country. That may or may not work because uh, although we we see that the Taliban has created the Islamic Emirate of Afghanistan, the reality is that the former government of Afghanistan has not gone away. Yes, uh, President Khrani is, has fled the country with lots of money, but his first vice president uh, basically is now the acting president of that uh, Afghan government. And he uh, he's a Tajik Dari speaker, and he's now associated with the Northern Alliance group of Ahmed, uh, um, oh, sorry, I've got a mental block, uh, but the uh, but the, the old uh, the son of the old Northern Alliance leader, and they have taken the Panjshir Valley and they're moving down into other areas, including around Kabul right now. So we've seen the revival of a civil war, which is something, as Gordon said, it's going to be difficult for Beijing to manage and control. At the same time. What it's done is it's uh, it's caused the Central Asian states uh, to be both anxious about the People's Republic of China because they don't believe that the Belt and Road Initiative is working for them, but they're also concerned about a resurgence of uh, Taliban-led insurgency coming up into the Central Asian states, particularly uh, into Uzbekistan. So what we've seen now is that this, the Central Asian states have abandoned the hope which President Trump gave them that they would get a stable route to trade to Guada port and in the Indian Ocean and escape from the controls of either China or or um, Russia. But now they're forced back into a reliance on, on Russia. Um, uh, I think it was Gordon who's quite right in mentioning the uh, Balochistan situation. Balochistan situation is critical because Balochistan actually uh, covers part of Pakistan, including the port of Gwada, which the uh, People's Republic of China built at great expense. It also is an Iranian part of Balochistan and an Afghan part of Balochistan. And they are notoriously uh, cranky. And they, they they kill everybody, including all the Pakistanis and Iranians and so on. So uh, it's a very volatile uh, area which on which uh, Beijing is relying. Yeah. Great, great insights. Actually, Nansu and then Casey, I want, to, I want to talk to you both a bit about this. Um, Nansu, I'm curious now, the Chinese Communist Party, of course, brutally persecutes Muslims in China. We can see this in uh, uh, Xinjiang, also called East Turkestan, where they've put really strict social control systems in place. Uh, but somehow the Chinese Communist Party still makes friends with these totalitarian Islamist regimes. Uh, regimes. Uh, really, and they seem to turn a blind eye to the CCP's human rights abuses, including genocide, now designated as such by many parts of the world, including the United States. How is it that the Chinese Communist Party can use genocide at targeting people based really on their religions and their religious practices, while still making friends with these totalitarian, well, terrorist organizations? Uh, now, now, what's your insight into this? Well, uh, the mind control thing, the uh, you know, the Chinese government's uh, persecution uh, against the, all these religious group, it's really limited in China. So because uh, if you know, that's the fundamental thing they will do. They will control everybody's mind, uh, so that you are not going to have even have a thoughts. Uh, against the regime. That's the fundamental way the regime will keep its own stability. Now. Once it go outside of China, the regime will totally change its attitude. They know they cannot change, uh, uh, they cannot force other people to agree wherever the way they want people to think. So it's all about Chinese government's so-called United Front project. Uh, it's been developed ever since, uh, you know, uh, the time of a, a former Soviet Union. So the common that's the communist way they. It's all about penetration into, uh, you know, uh, outside of the border of China to uh, to build a common interest to, or to find a common enemy uh, so they uh, they can find their, their allies. In this case, I mean, uh, uh, Taliban, it's a great, uh, a great um, ally of Chinese communist regime because the Taliban doesn't like uh, United States doesn't like the Western world, and China find the common enemy 
uh, with Taliban. So that's the base for them to build uh, their ally, uh, build their relationship. But of course, there will be other things going uh, on the economic interest. China will help them to give them more weapons and then help, uh, help them to build their infrastructures, so on and so forth. But it's really the common uh, enemy. That's the base. Uh, for the uh, Chinese government and uh, Taliban to start their relationship. Hmm. And uh, last but not least, Casey, I was, and thank you, Nancy. That's great insights as well. You know, Casey, we hear about all these things. We hear about China working with the Taliban. We hear about, I think, of course, people are concerned about the humanitarian element of it. But a lot of people also feel this may be far from them, that what happens in Afghanistan with China is China's business and uh, maybe it doesn't affect us in the long term. We are hearing talk about potential terror attacks and new threats now from the Taliban, but they're saying that they're not going to do it. I guess for the average American, what's your assessment on, you know, why should we care about this? What, what's your assessment on this in terms of how the CCP is getting involved here? Uh, all of it is closer than you think. It's closer than we think. I think if, if any anybody uh, looks at the past year and a half, uh, I think they'd be confounded to think and see all the world events, the U.S. events, the world events, and so on, as they accumulated and as they all rolled out over the past year and a half. So I think most people are confounded. I actually, uh, for somebody who's been at the front and the tip of the spear for, like I said, over a decade, I was actually shocked to see that what I thought might be uh, might uh, occur over six or seven years happened in about the first six or seven months of 2020. So um, you can so so that's why you care. That's why every American man, woman, and child, every allied in the Western world, man, woman, and child should care. You should care that they're keeping a database on your information. You should care what they're doing with it. They're using big data to store the stolen data, and then they're using artificial intelligence to to manipulate that data. Uh, we know the software they're using. It's American software that they're using to have that dossier on every American man, woman, and child. Uh, same with the UK, uh, French, Germans, Australians, New Zealanders, Canadians, and the rest of the rest of our allies. So yes, you care. Another point on cyber breaches. You say you know when you hear about a cyber attack or a cyber breach, uh, State Department today. Um, just for one example. Is that timing suspicious? I certainly think so. But the point is a cyber attack and a cyber breach, most of us are trained to think, well, that's just unfortunate for someone, but that doesn't bother me. Let, it, let me go about my day. The way I have to, the way I tell people that when you have a cyber breach, a chunk of America is gone forever for your children and your grandchildren. So whether you took a direct hit um, is one thing, um, but uh, your, your children and your grandchildren certainly did with, with cyber attack A, B, C, D, or all the way down to Z. So, so that's why you care. And, and people say, well, how do, I, how do I get involved? Number one, whenever you buy a Chinese product, by the way, China and the CCP are, are decoupling from the United States, from our country and our companies today. They're decoupling whether we like it or not. So wouldn't we like to get on the front end of that as an economy, as a country, and as U.S. businesses to have more of a workable plan and a strategic plan to decouple from China? Well, whenever you buy a product made in China or you do business with a, a company who is, done, who is doing business in China, you're accelerating the Chinese Communist Party's strategy against freedom and against uh, the United States and against your own children and your grandchildren. My question is, do you, does the audience have anybody in their family, ancestors or family members who fought for freedom? Um, you know, so our turn to fight for freedom is now. Every American is on the front lines. It's not our military on the front lines. It's every American citizen and our allies are on the front lines today. So that's why you care. Um, you know, what can you do to get involved? Put congressmen and congresswomen in who are aware of this, this threat, of this risk, of this war, and want to do something about it. So, so vote people in that are going to do something about it. Look at where you're buying products. You know, try not to buy products from China to accelerate the Chinese Communist Party strategy. Um, you know, try to find those products from an allied country or the United States. So, um, in a nutshell, that's why you care. Back to you, Josh. Thank you, Casey. 
All right, well, last question here is from Elizabeth Valenzuela. This is for Gordon. It says, uh, hello, Gordon Chang. Thank you for all you do. I need to read one of your books. <laughs> so can you tell me which one to read first? Well, I really wouldn't read the books. I'd just go on my website where I, ar I archive my articles for free um, because things are changing so fast. And that's the real dynamic right now for us to keep up with what's occurring. Um, because events, and it's not just Afghanistan, it's not just China, uh, it's everywhere. So um, really, it's, it's just newspaper articles, um, events of the day um, that are really going to um, be able to defend ourselves. As Casey says, every American's on the front line. And uh, that means we've got to be informed, all of us, and we've got to take the measures that Casey talked about. Hmm. Yeah, thank you, Gordon. All right, we're out of time. So just, uh, I guess, any last comments? Uh, Gordon, any last comments? Anything we missed you want to touch on briefly? We're in, a, in an existential fight. China believes that it should rule the world. It should rule the near parts of the solar system. Um, it wants to, it's fomenting violence on our streets. These are more than just acts of subversion. These are acts of war. And it's up to us to defend ourselves appropriately, which means that, uh, as I think it was Casey or somebody said, look, they've called us an enemy. So um, turn the favor. And we've got to understand that although we may not want to um, um, engage in what's a cold war, whatever it is, uh, we have no choice because the Chinese are doing so. Hmm. Uh, uh, I, just, uh, oh, Nansu, yeah. just one minute if you have any last thoughts. Yes, uh, I want to uh, uh, add one thing. There was a lot for a lot of Americans still think about uh, trying to engage China. Uh, I think we need to look back to our own history. In the last century, there was two ways we deal with communist regimes. So one is the way we deal with the Soviet Union. We make it weaker, weaker every day. Eventually, the changes start from within and the regime collapse. And another way is the Chinese, uh, the way our China policy, we make the communist regime stronger and richer every day. And uh, and look at what has led us to where we are facing today. So the history is there for our to look for the answers. That's what I want to say. Thank you. Uh, Greg Koppel, any last thoughts? Yes, I mean, particularly uh, Nan mentioned the history of weakening the Soviet Union. During the Reagan White House, uh, the National Security Council mounted a, a major psychological warfare campaign against the Soviet Union by smuggling in fax machines and copier machines, and then started faxing in uh, some of that books, in other words, books which were hostile to the Soviet government and information so that it could be distributed internally. We need to, to come up with a similar way of breaching the Great Firewall in the PRC. It's not going to be, well, probably not going to be fax machines and copiers, uh, but it's got to be something which gets through it and enables the distribution of information. And then we need to study what information actually will drive and, and impress and motivate uh, the Chinese population to take its life into its own hands and to be able to resist uh, the, the CCP. Hmm. Great, thank you. And uh, Casey, any last thoughts? Yes, Chinese proverb, be careful raising a baby tiger. One day it will grow up and eat you. Great. Everyone, Good. thanks for being here. Again, that's uh, Casey Fleming, CEO of Black, Op Black Ops Partners, Gregory Copley, President of International Strategic Studies Association, Gordon Cheng, columnist and author of The Coming Collapse of China, and Nan Su, senior reporter at the Epoch Times. Uh, all of you, thank you again for being here. It's been a real pleasure having you on. Thank you. Thank you, Josh. Thank you, guys. Great. And also for our audience, um, this is hopefully the first of many China webinars we're going to be having each month. So be sure to check out the next one we hold. And as always, appreciate your support. Thank you, everyone, for being here. And uh, that said, good night. Thank you. Good night. Communism is a belief in the destruction of belief. It destroys religion wherever it goes. So who is the unholy father of communism? Francois Noël Gracchus Baba. The French Revolution. 
would be remembered for its unjust bloodshed, killing over 300,000 people. It was a period known as the Reign of Terror. <laughs>